Hi, thanks for coming. My internet connection is unstable. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Great, okay. Um, welcome, thank you for joining. And I am excited to learn with you a little today. Um, I hope everybody is, you know, I, I've noticed how our greetings have gone for like, how are you doing with this crazy adventure to like, I hope you're doing okay. Um, so I hope you are doing okay and that you have um, health in your family, confident medical care. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's sort of where we're at for now. Um, my topic today is the four sons. I'm going to try and do something. Um, I'm going to share a thing. What's the thing? The word for thing is a, um, a source sheet. I'm going to share with everybody in the link rather than sometimes I'll put it on the screen, but this way, if you want to open in Google docs, this is in the chat. You guys all zoom proficient by now. Yeah, kind of <laughs> a little bit. So in the chat, if you can't see it, you could click on chat at the bottom. I put a link to a Google doc that you can follow along with me. I'll try and share the screen at crucial moments also. Um, but you know, there it is. So I want to talk about the four sons. Um, I've been teaching the four sons a lot this week. I'll talk later why some, some of what's happened has been super fascinating for me. Um, so I've been teaching it a lot to teenagers. I'm really interested to see. I think adults will have a very different perspective on some of the same things um, because that's part of what's going on actually is that they're sort of different perspectives are, are happening at the same time. Um, so I'm just going to start with the text of the Haggadah. I guess I will share it because most of us are not even on video. Um, here we are. So this is my, um, this is the I'm going to go to the top. So here's our Haggadah, right? This is the text that we all know and love. We have four sons, Chacham, Rasha, Tam, Sheno, Yedel, right? I keep on like counting on my fingers and people can't see me. So Chacham, Rasha, Tam, Sheno, Yedel, Yishol, right? The wise son, the wicked son, the Tam, how we might we translate that? You can unmute yourself if you want to answer. Or you could put it in the chat and then I can figure out how to see the chat while I'm also sharing. I don't know, pure, naive, okay, pure. Right. Naive, pure are kind of like a positive vibe, right? Um, where is the chat? That's so interesting. Um, right, naive and pure are kind of like, you know, like Yaakov Ishtam, um, right? Like the Yaakov is, is described as, um, the, you know, pure, simple man, right? At the same time, right, you can call him, um, you could say he's like simple as in a simpleton. Um, the Yerushalmi, which I have on the sheet, but we probably won't look at so much, actually calls him the tipesh, right? It's stupid. Um, but I think that, you know, our, I think it's the Yerushalmi, maybe it's the Michal, right? There, there are sort of earlier sources that call him the tipesh, but like, you know, our text chooses to call him the Tom because maybe he's not tipesh. Maybe he is sort of naive and innocent in a good way. Um, and then the one who doesn't know how to ask. Fine. So like, you know, this is sort of well-trodden territory for many of us. Um, I guess my entry point, the question, how many children, first of all, I got, I got grief from my mother. Those of you who know her will appreciate it. I got grief because I called it how many sons. She was like, you can't call it sons. It's children, especially at Drisha. So I changed the title on the source sheet to how many children. Um, so <laughs> thank you, Susan. <laughs> so, um, so how many children, right? Uh, that's, that's sort of a hook, but it's not We'll see how we answer that question at the end. I, don't, I, I know that the whole year is going to revolve around that question, but it does is going to revolve around where do these sort of children come from? Um, and you know, we we know this text from the Haggadah. You can see further down. There's actually precursor texts in the Mechilta and the Yerushalmi. But where did the rabbi like these are all rabbinic texts, right? Like there's a rabbinic idea that there's four sons and each of them has a question and an answer. One of them doesn't have a question and has an answer. But where did these where did these things where does this text come from? And I think what we can, we can look at it as, it's actually a composite of other texts, right? The main building block could be, I'm gonna stop for a second because I'm having difficulty. My sound keeps going away. I finally saw your thing. Is that still a problem? No. No, okay, thank you. Um, I may have to kick someone else off the internet. I don't know. Um, so. Right. The main building block texts of our four sons texts are biblical verses, right? 
right? Like you could see here, Deuteronomy 6, 6 to Exodus 12. So I wanted to start by looking at those. Oh, I apologize if I am having an unstable internet connection. Um, I'll do my best. And if you need me to repeat, I will. I'm getting little notices from Zoom that I'm having a problem. Um, and maybe I will, well, whatever, we'll see. Let me know. You can unmute. I think the easiest way, if, you, if you're really having trouble hearing me, if you unmute yourself, I'll, I'll hear you better than trying to go back to the chat. So, um, right. When we look at the biblical sources, we'll see, here we see there's also a source from the Mishnah, right? When we look at the biblical sources, we'll see some of these things are expected and some maybe are not. Um, so I wanted to look at the biblical sources in the order that they appear in the Bible. It is true that the idea of your son will ask you a question and you will tell him, or not even your son will ask you as we'll see, right? Telling your son something about the Exodus or your child something about the Exodus appears four times in the Chumash. Um, and, oh, here's my color coding. That's a secret. That's for later. Don't look. Um, just kidding. So here, um, we'll just go through those in sort of the order that they appear in the Tanakh. So the first time is in Exodus 12, right? Shmot Yud Bet, which is sort of starts with HaChodesh. This is the first mitzvah to B'nai Israel. Before this Sefer Shmot has all been narratives, right? The Jews are in Egypt, all these plagues are happening, Moshe, all this, you know, sort of the story that we're familiar with. Um, and now, right, this is intentionally out of context for a minute. Right, when your children ask, what do you mean by this right? Right, you should say, Right. This is a Passover sacrifice for God because he passed over our houses when he smote the Egyptians, but saved our house. Then the people bowed low. Okay, so you can kind of get, gather from here that the context of this pasuk, right, it's talking about not a particular mitzvah, right? What particular mitzvah does that sound like? Korban Pesach. Right. This is it's saying you're going to bring the Korban Pesach and your children are going to be like, what are you doing? And you're going to explain. Right. And it's not your children in Egypt. It's your children afterwards who you're going to explain sort of retroactively. This is mirroring what we did in the past. But the context is the mitzvah of Korban Pesach. Um, right. And that's why the answer is Amartem Zevach Pesachu. Right. This is the Pesach sacrifice. Great. So we have a question. They say, what is this Avodah? Right. And you say, right, this is a Zevach Pesach, right? Avodah means in this context in Pshat, probably the sacrificial service. That's the thing that Avodah can mean, right? So all of this, you know, for those who know what we make of Avodah and the Seder, right? Like in the Pshat, it's just, what is the sacrificial service? And you say, this is a Pesach offering, okay? Um, whose question is this in the Haggadah? Multiple children. Actually, no. But the it's the Russia, right? It's the Russia, right? Over here in the previous page, right? The Russia asked the question in green, lachem. And that's why, you know, there's all people talk about, he says avoda, he thinks it's work. He doesn't understand that it's so joyful, right? All these sort of like disparaging ways of reading his question. Even in the Yerushalmi, it says maha like what's all this trouble that you're going through? Um, but here, it's not clear that it's a, a bad question, right? And the answer is like very straightforward. This is not the answer we give to the Russia in the Haggadah. So let's go on for a second, right? I, oh, sorry. I'm having, I know people are saying things in the chat and I'm having trouble seeing it. Maybe I need to make this, I don't know. He's, he's, he's pointing to the plural B'nai Chem in the Pasuk. Right. right, so if you think about how many children there are, right, that's a good indication that um, that's a good indication that the, the Torah is not thinking of like this son, that son. Every one of these psukim sounds like you may, there may be children, individual or collective, who ask this kind of question. Yehudis, can I ask you to like let me know when something happens in the chat and what it says? Is that okay? Sure, no problem. Yeah. The chat yeah. master, thank you. Uh, sure. Micah had mentioned that there are multiple children asked right. in the verse. Right. Right, so yeah, so right this time Susan helps out, but I'm saying like in general, okay. if you sure. can help me out, thank you. Um, you got it. I think of myself as like the Zoom expert because I've been teaching on Zoom for three weeks in high school, but apparently not. Um, so right, there, right here it's, it's your multiple sons. 
there's no indication in the pasuk that this is a particular type of son who's bad and antagonistic, right? Like your children, any child would reasonably ask, what is this Korban Pesach about? Right, good point. Um, okay, so our next verse does not have a question in it at all, right? You should tell your child on that day because of, well, what it, it sounds like, because of this, God did for me when I, when I went free from Egypt. Um, the translation is because of what the, I do this because of what the Lord did for me. The kind of directionality of the because is a little bit confused in the verse, um, right? But you're doing something because God took me out of Egypt. Um, does anyone know what mitzvah we're doing in Exodus 13? I'll show us, right? Here we are, Exodus 13. I can make it Hebrew and English. Um, eating matzah. Yeah, right. We're eating matzah. The child is not asking any question, right? And we tell them, well, you know, we do this thing, we eat this funny bread because um, God took us out of Egypt. So first of all, right, this, this sort of naturally, if you have the, the, um, the structure of four sons, one of whom doesn't know how to ask, it's pretty, this naturally lends itself to being that son, right? Because there's no question in the pasuk. Um, and you tell him, I do this because God took me out of Egypt. Um, I think it's not, it's an interesting thing that this is um, connected to matzah in particular. Matzah is the thing that you're going to spontaneously explain, even if your child doesn't ask you. Um, there's a Gemara in Psachim that says matzah is called lechem oni because it's lechem she'onin alav dvarim, or dvarim harbe, right? It's the bread that you say stuff over. Um, and when you first read it, you might wonder, like, why, why, first of all, like, that's, you know, it's a nice midrash in some ways, but like, why, is there any indication in the Torah that matzah is connected to talking? Um, so I think this pasuk is kind of that connection, right? Matzah is sort of like the crucial thing that's connected to talking, um, that's connected to like spontaneously bringing out the story. Um, and maybe we'll come back to that at the very, very end, right? Like what's, what is matzah? Why is matzah so special? But for now, right, we have, sometimes you might be explaining the mitzvah of matzah to your child, and you would do so by reference to Yitzhiyat Mitzrayim. If we go back to our four sons, we can see that this is, in fact, the Sheno Yudeli Shul, right? However, this answer is also the answer to the Rasha, right? The Rasha asks this question, in the Pasuk, his answer is, Va'amartem Zevach Pesach, right? Why doesn't the Haggadah just said, you should say to him, Amartem Zevach Pesach It's choosing to key on the Lachem instead. Right, so it's picking up, it, you know, it's doing a Midrash, it has, a, maybe you were saying it has a direction it wants to go to, so it's taking this Lachem word, and then it's, you know, contrasting it with Li, we'll talk more about this in a few minutes. Um, I think also, right, Va'amartem Zevach Pesach is not, like, our Haggadah, has sort of excised the Korban Pesach to some degree. I was just teaching the original four questions, right? The third question is, why are we eating roasted meat, right? Our Haggadah doesn't have that question because we're not eating roasted meat. So, right, our Haggadah is kind of not so interested in an answer that is specific to the Korban Pesach because it's looking for things that are more relevant to us. Um, so the overlap between the Rasha and the Shino Yudeli Shul is going to become... Um, an interesting thing later, I think. But for now, let's just note it, right? And interestingly, right, like the valence of sort of God did for me, but not for you, that's present with the Rasha is not present, we would assume, for, this, for the one who doesn't know how to ask, right? Like we read the same verse as kind of like a dig at the wicked son, but for the um, sort of son who doesn't know how to ask, it's just considered like a normal explanation as it appears in the Pshat. We have two more sukim in the Chumash to look at. One is here. So we're still in Exodus. We're going a little further in Exodus 13, right? When the time comes, your son asks you, right? Mazot, what is this? Right? Two word question is going to become the question of the simple son. Kind of makes sense. The love, you should say to him, right? God took us out of Egypt with a um, from the house of bondage, which a mighty hand, right? And that's where the, the Haggadah ends. If we go up for a second, um, right? That's where the Haggadah ends. Um, 
But the text actually does not end there. It keeps going. When Paro didn't want to send us out, God killed all the firstborns of Egypt. Therefore, I sacrifice every first male issue of the womb, um, but redeem the ones of all my son. And this makes it a sign. Okay, so, right, in its original context, this pasuk is also about a specific mitzvah. It's not about a mitzvah that has to do with Pesach at all. It's about a mitzvah that has to do with the Bechor, right? Right, either redeeming the firstborn or sacrificing the firstborn or trading a non-kosher firstborn animal for an animal that can be sacrificed. But like, this is about the firstborn sacrifice. It may happen in the spring, I guess, if that's when babies or baby animals are born, but it's not a Pesach mitzvah at all. Um, and because of that, the Haggadah kind of cuts off the part that's not Pesach related, takes this first Pasuk and makes it into a Pesach Pasuk, okay? Um, and finally, so I guess what I'll say, so far we have three different mitzvot. Two are about Pesach. One is not about Pesach, but is connected to Yitzhi Mitzrayim. In the Torah, it seems like every time your child encounters something concrete that seems weird, that has an explanation that comes from Yitzhi Mitzrayim, you would tell them, you would explain it to them in that way. It's not different kinds of children or different children. It's just different situations in which Yitzhi Mitzrayim would be a relevant thing to tell your child. So far so good? Okay. Um, here's our fourth example. Right. Um, when your child asks you tomorrow, meaning in the far future, right? We're in, we've now moved to Devarim. So this is Moshe talking to the people who themselves didn't leave Egypt necessarily, right? About what will happen in future generations. It says, right, if your child asks you, what? So ma is an, ma, you could translate as what are, or here they translate as what mean these decrees, laws, and rules that the Lord or God has commanded you. And you should say, Avadim hayinu Mitzrayim. We were slaves to Paro in Egypt. This is in our Haggadah, but not in the four sons. But Yitzhenu Hashem Mitzrayim. We have a Yitzhenu Hashem Elokeinu Misham Biyad Chazaka. Right? God took us out with a mighty hand. So our Avadim hayinu kind of is loosely based on this pasuk. Right? You should say we were slaves in Egypt, and God did all these miracles, and He freed us so that He would give us this land. And and God commanded us to do all the mitzvot, right? And it, it will be good for us if we do, in fact, do all the mitzvot. Um, there is a very, very famous pasuk in the Torah that also appears in Devarim 6, which is, anyone recall? Arguably the most famous pasuk in the world, right? It's Shema happens yeah. earlier, right? Shema happens earlier in Devarim Vav, right? So like, the context here is not any particular mitzvah. The context is right. The son is asking, why do we do all of this stuff? And the answer is we do this because it's part of our covenant with God that God sort of sealed with us by taking us out of Egypt. Right. Um, that didn't work. So unlike the other three, this is a question that's not prompted by a specific concrete activity, right? And this question becomes the question of the wise son, right? So again, this is the kind of thing that a normal child would ask, but it becomes a question of the wise son. I think that's not an accident, right? It is the most sort of abstract. First of all, it's the question with the most words, just sort of in a basic, like it has the most details from Mahaido. This kid has a good vocabulary, right? Um, and they're, they're thinking abstractly. They're saying like, what's behind this whole system? They're not like, what happened to that baby donkey? Why are you eating that funny bread? They're sort of thinking more abstractly. So it kind of makes sense that it would be the question of the wise son once you're in the idea that there should be a wise son, right? That you're, you, if you want, we'll talk at the end maybe about why, but if you, if you have this idea to make a midrash in which you're going to talk not about in general children asking questions about different things, but about different kinds of questions that children can ask, right? It makes sense that this would be sort of the, the wise, sophisticated son. Um, so in the Chumash, this son has an answer, right? The answer to him is, I'm going to make that a little bigger. Um, the answer to him, oh, are you joking? Um, right, in the Chumash, the answer to this question is, oh, we were slaves to power in Egypt, God took us out, he gave us his land, yada, yada. Um, that seems like it would be a great answer in the Haggadah as well. 
I would think, right? So it's sort of interesting that that is not, in fact, the answer in the Haggadah. The answer in the Haggadah is, right? You should tell him, like, the laws of Pesach, right? Um, you tell him the laws of Pesach, that you don't do afikomen after eating the Korban Pesach. There's machloket as to what exactly that means, but it seems like you don't either continue your meal or you don't leave the house after the Korban Pesach. Um, where does that come from, right? So this is another way in which the four sons is a composite text, because these words, Ein Maftirin, Achar, Pesach, Afikoman, come from the Mishnah in Pesachim, the very end, sort of the last chapter of Pesachim, of Masech of Pesachim, most of it is about the Korban Pesach. The last chapter is about the Seder, what we would call the Seder. Um, and near the very end of it, it says, right, after it goes through, right, like, here's what you bring on the Seder plate. Here you ask the questions. Here's what you should do for Magid. It says, um, right, you shouldn't eat anything after the Pesach. The Tosefta explains, you know, you shouldn't eat, like, you know, you shouldn't have palate cleansers or whatever, nuts, um, things that they used to eat, I guess. So, right, it seems like the simplest understanding of the Chacham is, right, he asks this sort of complex question. In the Torah, his question is about, um, like the, you could call it like hashkafa, right? Like the ideas behind keeping the mitzvot in general. Here, it's very, it feels very rabbinic, right? They, they look at it as like, he's asking for all the details, right? He wants to know the edot chukim and mishpatim and all the differences between them. So you give him all the details up to, right? Even up to sort of the end of the Mishnah and Pesachim, right? You go through the whole, all the detail, all the halachot with him, even up to the point of, you don't need anything after the Korban Pesach. Meaning it, this is picked, as an exemplar of a halacha, because this is sort of like the end of the halacha. The point is you go through everything with him, right? Like if he's so detail-oriented and abstract thinking, like you can load him up with halacha. Um, so uh, that already is kind of interesting, right? Interestingly though, like it's not that the answer to the chacham has been omitted. The answer to the chacham exists. It actually has already happened in a Haggadah when we said avadim hayinu. Right? So it's not like we're neglecting that side of the story. We've just tried to convey that to everybody. And now we're transforming the Chacham into somebody who wants to know the details. So we have the Chacham who has a question that I think is plausibly introduced as like the Chacham kind of question, right? Um, it's like the complex abstract question. And the rabbis sort of see that as the opportunity to give him a lot of legal details. We have the Rasha who asks a question that in the Pshat is a very reasonable question and gets responded to by a Pasuk that's completely not next to it, right? The time um, asks what is it? It's sort of lifted out of its original context of the firstborn sons and made more generally applicable to Passover. And the Shinoi Daily Show, right, um, is sort of as it appears in the Chomish, basically. Um, so one of the nice things that this color coding does for me is um, it highlights the difficult areas, I think, or it highlights the areas that are going to be most fruitful for trying to sort of, for later commentaries in some way. Um, what are these, right, the Chacham, his answer is missing, right? So like, if you're trying to make a drasha on this drasha, right, you have the text of the Chumash, which has like children in general. You have this rabbinic idea that it's actually talking about four types of children. Now, if you want to be a commentator on this text about the four types of children, what are the, the places that are sort of likely to be fruitful, right? I think this is a good way to think about Midrash, when you look at a pasuk, where is there likely to be a midrash? It's where there's a discontinuity. So where is there likely to be like a fruitful area of commentary on this text of our Haggadah? It's where there's something weird about it, right? Honestly, there's something weird everywhere, except for the tam, which is kind of like form follows content in some way, right? The tam is sort of like straightforward, the same question and answer from the same place in the Chumash, great. Um, there's something weird with Chacham because his answer is not from the Chumash, even though there is an answer to this question in the Chumash. The Rasha, to me, is the one with the most discontinuity because it's sort of a mashup, right? You take, there is an answer to this question, but you answer with a different thing, and that different thing doesn't necessarily mean what the Haggadah is saying it means because you also answer it to the Shinoi Yudeli Shol, right? Shinoi Yudeli Shol also is kind of like there. I think, right, Chacham and Rasha kind of get the most bandwidth sometimes. Um, but that's because of they, they get prominence in this text in some way. They're put first. They're the ones with sort of like the text has gone the most out of its way to make something of them. So in some ways that leaves the most opening for trying to figure out what that is. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's sort of, I wanted to start, I wanted to start in on that and specifically on the Rasha, because I think a lot of us, especially with a contemporary mindset, kind of 
the, the answer to the Rasha is a little disturbing, right? I'll just read it so we're all on the same page. Rasha Mahomer, what does the, the wicked son say? First of all, we're calling him the wicked son. My teenage students were very upset about that. I tried to redeem him, but they really didn't like that. Why would you call him wicked? He's asking a reasonable question, he, whatever, which is fine, um, right? Ma'avodazo what is this service to you? We saw in the Pshad it means a temple service, but okay. Lachem um, below low. Now this is sort of like the author of Agada speaking, the, the narrator, right? He said lachem, he meant to you and not to himself. And because he removed himself from the collective, he has um, denied a fundamental principle. And so you should hakei et shinav, you should something his teeth, the amor lo, and say to him, because of this, God, God did this for, or I did this because God took me out of Egypt, or because of this, God, God took me out of Egypt for me, but not for him. Because if he was there, he wouldn't have been taken out. Um, so here the, the quotations end in a particular place. What do you say to the wicked son? What is the last word that you say to him? Right. So here, I mean, the, wherever, hmm? Mitzrayim, right? It seems like it could be, right? You say, the last word you say is Mitzrayim. Again, in the precursor text to the Haggadah, it doesn't say, if he had been there, he would not have been redeemed. It says, if you had been there, you would not have been redeemed. Meaning that you, the parents are actually supposed to say to the kid, God did it for me and he wouldn't have done it for you. Um, but our text of the Haggadah doesn't have that. So I think it's reasonable to ask, like, maybe that's not, our text is intentionally saying, you don't have to say to him in so many words, if you were there, you wouldn't have been redeemed, right? But you're kind of implying it in some way. Um, and I think a lot of us find this kind of, distressing and uh, maybe i'm i'm projecting i don't know do people you can nod or thumbs up or something how do you feel about that you're not really engaging uh, the rasha in why this is important for you right you're just sort of you're dismissing him in some way yeah. right? like we tend to think if a kid has a question even a critical question that your job is to meet them where they are and try and help them engage right um and the fact is this kid showed up Right. There's a lot of people who like to write about the fifth child in the Haggadah who's not even there, right? Um, I think, you know, in pre-modern times, showing up is less of a big deal because, like, you have to eat somewhere. Where are you going to go? But, um, but yeah, like, it, it feels kind of like he's, um, it feels very harsh to us. So I wanted to use that as kind of an entry point into what's going on um, in these passages to learn some, some kind of, um, go a little deeper into it. Um, yeah. So I'm going to skip down here. I'm going to, for your perusal, you can look at the Yerushalmi and the Mechilta, which are like precursor texts to our text. I'm not super interested in the details of them. I just thought they were cool if they exist. Um, so actually, before I, before I go to the Kliyakar, um, what, what does this Hakei et Shinav mean? It does not mean hit his teeth like hey, kaf, hey. It's hey, kuf, hey, hey, right? It is not asking you to punch him in the face, interpret it that way. Um, it's asking you to blunt his teeth or set his teeth on edge. So we'll see that also is part of the way that this Haggadah is a composite text. It's based on previous texts. We will talk about which texts momentarily. But I guess in terms of talking about the Ben Rasha, the wicked son, um, before I try and, you know, interpret it out of existence or not really, I just wanted to acknowledge, right? Like one approach is sort of affirmation, right? Like this sounds disturbing, but like, that's because you're supposed to like, you know, it's right. Um, so here we have a Kliyakar, which is a super commentary, I believe on the Chumash. And he says, right, Hakeyat Shinav doesn't explain what makes his, his teeth, what sets his teeth on age. Al-Kain Asa Perush Al-Pasuk, right? He's trying to explain He's sort of in a long passage engaging in this question we have of sort of why does the Haggadah seem to take questions out of context? If this is really the question of the wicked son, how does the answer of Amartam Zevach Pesach answer it? And he's saying, actually, the question, the answer of Amartam Zevach Pesach does respond to the wicked son exclusion of himself. You say to him, um, from this pasuk, right? 
From this pasuk, it will become understood. Right? The korban pesach is the thing that in Egypt saved us from makat bechorot, from the plague. Um, umimela, when you tell him that, right? God took me out of Egypt because of this. He'll understand, right, that he wouldn't have been included in that, right? The, the Russia says, what is this about? And you're like, actually, this is the thing that got me saved from Egypt. The Russia's mind is supposed to start to turn and he's supposed to say, oh, well, I wouldn't have done this because I think it's dumb. Therefore, I wouldn't have been redeemed. Um, so it's sort of like a, it's almost like a logical consequence thing. It's not like he would have been punished. He just wouldn't have done the thing you needed to do to be redeemed. Now, like maybe he doesn't believe that all to begin with, but it, it softens a little bit by, while well, still basically, you know, um, holding strong on what is it that, um, that you're saying to the son, you're literally telling him he would not have been, if you don't think Korban Pesach is important, you would not have been redeemed from Egypt, right? Because like Korban Pesach is the thing that saved us. Um, I think as you get into later, here, here my translation skills have run out. I apologize, but I'll translate as I read. Um, as you get into the later sources, more contemporary, not contemporary, but people in the modern era, I think the question of the wicked son became more live for a lot of people. Um, as we'll see, they start to talk about it in a slightly different way, right? Where all of a sudden you have lots of Jews who um, don't want to participate in these sort of foundational rituals in the traditional way let's say. Um, so the Beit HaLevi, Beis HaLevi, I never know. I just got corrected on this. People like to have consistency. So I said, if I'm going to say Shmot, I'm going to say Beit HaLevi. But, you know, he would have called himself the Beis HaLevi. He's um, one of the, he's a, oh, now I'm blanking. He's one of the Soloveitchik ancestors. Um, I'll tell you in a second. But so he's writing in the like 19th century, probably. Um, one sec. Yeah, it's the, the first Rav Yosef Dov Soloveitchik, um, born in 1820, um, father of Rav Chaim Frisker. So, um, so he says, imagine, right? There's a father at the table with all of his kids, and one of the kids is like a Russia who's basically a heretic, but he's in part of the family, so they're all at the seder, right? Um, there's you can. You know, I don't know if anybody's ever done any of these explorations of sort of the the visual representations of the four sons, but a lot of them have them, you know, sitting around the table and there's one, you know, like there's one that I'm thinking of where it's like the two younger, the two younger sons always get short shrift. They're always just kind of like meh, they're just there. But the old, the Chacham and the Rush are kind of where a lot of the drama comes in in terms of the art. So the Chacham is there like, you know, bent over his book and the Rush is like leaning back smoking. Um, but, you, you know, he's still there because he's part of the family, right? Um, so the father is going through the, the Haggadah and he gives everybody, you know, each of the mitzvah foods. He passes around the matzah, he passes around the maror, and then when it comes time to pass around the korban Pesach, he skips the Russia. Because the halacha is that, right, the mitzvot of matzah and maror are kind of all-inclusive. Anybody can have them, even people who are uncircumcised and cannot legally eat the korban Pesach can eat, should eat, have a mitzvah to eat matzah. I mean, even men who aren't circumcised, women who are uncircumcised also have a mitzvah to eat matzah, um, right? But like, right. Um, but when it comes to Korban Pesach, there's a midrash that says, right, if somebody has sort of removed themselves from Klal Yisrael in some way, then they are not included in the Korban Pesach. So the father is giving out matzah, he's giving out mara, he comes around to the Korban Pesach and he skips the, the sort of heretical son. Um, and the son says, right, am I not a, a Jew like you, right? I also left Egypt like you. Why are you setting me apart? Here, this is probably the editor saying, right, everybody should understand that this is exactly what the Musculum say to us, right? We're also Jews, right? Why is this any less our tradition than your tradition? Um, and this is why the answer to him is, right, if you were there, actually, you would not have been redeemed, right? Like you think you're a Jew, right? Like you're a Jew just like us and you also left Egypt like us. Well, no, you didn't, 
right? Really like doubling down in some ways on the harshness of the Haggadah, right? The Haggadah is like, if he had been there, he wouldn't have been redeemed. And he's, the Beis HaLevi is kind of like presenting this idea of like, yeah, like he thinks he would have been redeemed. He thinks he's part of the Jewish people. Like he's like an authentic voice of the Jewish people. And you're supposed to tell him like, absolutely not. Um, so I'm not, I don't know, you know, you can feel that how you will about that. Um, I just think, you know, before, I think it's important to acknowledge that there's a range of voices about this. And some people are really comfortable with the exclusion of the wicked son and actually feel like it's, you know, important. Um, I'm going to skip down for a second to one, one more example of that. We'll come back to this in a minute. B'nai Banim, which is, I believe this is Rav Henkins, Shiva, right? He says, sometimes it's necessary to cut contact with the wicked child, even though he's our child. Um, because as long as he's just sort of there to try and mess up the religious atmosphere of the family, in particular the other children, sometimes you can't engage him, right? So like, there are people who really embrace this sort of like rejectionism of the Haggadah. Um, but that said, there's a few ways that it can be kind of turned, let's say, or pushed in a different direction. Um, one is the following. This is from the Khatam Sofer. Again, somebody very much dealing with the reality, right? The Khatam Sofer is kind of like, uh, 19th century Ramosha Sofer, like, um, you know, European scholar, very much dealing with the reality of the enlightenment or trying to push back against it. Um, and here's what he says, right? He's going to, he's going to get us to our, what is Hakei at Shinav? Where do those words come from? Does anyone know? Well, here it is on the, on the stage, but on the screen, Hakei at Shinav, the, the verb kaha, kuf hei hei appears, I believe, four or five times in the Tanakh. Three or four of them, meaning all but one of them, are the same, essentially. The same little um, folk saying that appears in a few places. Which is here, right? Avot achlu voser b'shinei banim tikena. Right? The fathers ate voser is sour grapes. B'shinei banim tikena. And the teeth of the children were set on edge, right? Which means, right, like, la hakot de chinat is the feeling you get when you bite into something sour, like, oof, right? Um, so, ordinarily, when somebody eats sour grapes, if the fathers ate sour grapes, whose teeth get set on edge? Right, like, the people who ate the grapes. So, this little saying is a way of saying, it's not, it's sort of a way, a complaint or a way of saying it's not fair. Just because our fathers did something wrong, why should we suffer? In the context of Nevi Machronim, it's sort of saying, you know, our parents sinned and did a vote are, why are we being exiled or why are we continuing to suffer in exile? Um, so this is what, it's not that Hakei et Shinav always right, set his teeth on edge is a physical sensation. But when you use those words in the context of a Jewish text, you're recalling the use of that, that phrase in the Tanakh. And in the Tanakh, it's in the context of children and parents and who's responsible for whose situation, right? Um, so there's going to be a few ways to take that in terms of the wicked son, right? If what you're supposed to do is respond to the wicked son by setting his teeth on edge, which recalls this pasuk, um, with the way I set it up, right, you can sort of already sort of hear children and parents and who's responsible for what can go in several directions with the wicked sons. So the Chateau Sofer, he's still, you know, pretty open to rejecting the wicked son, but he's going to shift the blame a little bit. He says, our eyes see, because the parent, that the parents, right, even though they haven't actually stopped doing mitzvot, they go to Minyan, they keep Shabbos, they keep kosher, but they don't really care. He calls it mitzvot anashim ulumada. It's like a habit, right? They don't talk divrei Torah at the Shabbos table. They don't learn, whatever it is, right? Um, so their children don't sort of have a teacher in the way, the children who don't have a model for a true engagement with the Torah, with their, or with God, from their parents, um, they don't sort of appreciate that. Um, it just seems like this is their parents sort of like, he says, and they're going to do their own thing. Um, 
And so he's saying, wait, this is actually a case where right? the parents have actually ingested sort of the negative, negative vibe of the age, I guess he would say, right? Um, but not fully. It's sort of unripe. Sour grapes are unripe. So the parents are sort of like unripe um, heretics, he calls them basically. And the children become fully formed heretics because they don't have true religious models. Um, so on the one hand, he's like very much embracing the idea of rejecting the wicked son. He's a heretic. You don't want that. But instead of saying, right, like, instead of the Haggadah saying, yeah, you parents, like, you know what's right and you kick him out. They're saying, you parents, look at yourselves about how he got that way. Right? Maybe he got that way because of what you did or didn't pass on to him. Um, so I think that that sort of ameliorates the harshness to some degree, not ex not entirely, but at the very least, right? Like, if to me it feels more sort of okay to be giving musr to yourself than to be pushing your child away, right? If the ta if that is giving musr to the the sort of the fifth character in this scene is the parent, right? That's sort of at least maybe that person who is there and is, is trying to listen needs to hear that more than like sort of pushing away your own child. But um, so that's sort of like, I would say like a, a half turn away from the rejectionism that appears in the Haggadah originally. Um, I'm going to see if we can make a little more of a turn. Um, so the fir one thing, the first thing to say um, is this, right? Uh, even a, a little further step is the second half of this passage for B'nai Banim that I saw before, right? He says there's another message. The same verse serves in the Haggadah as the response to the wicked child and to the Shino Yodeli Shol, which we saw, right? So like, maybe there's reasons for that, but it's sort of strange that the thing that means like, oh, this is for me and not for you, for one kid just means like, yeah, this is our mitzvah and is totally not value-laden in the same way for the other child. So Repankin says, right, sometimes the border between the two is blurry right? You actually don't know whether your child is sort of wicked or not good at formulating questions, right? Maybe they are not asking a question because they're totally checked out and think you're dumb, or maybe they're not asking a question because they don't know how to say. And you could even say the opposite. Maybe they're asking a question that sounds antagonistic because they are antagonistic, or maybe they're asking a question that sounds antagonistic because that's sort of how it came out and they're a grumpy teenager. I don't know. Um, I will say, well, I'll get to it later in a second. Um, they, so, were, they were texting and you couldn't actually read emotion appropriately. <laughs> it's true. It just got lost in the, in the emojis, right? Or whatever it is, right? So like, sometimes you don't know which child it is, right? Um, and that's why, you know, they have the same answer in some ways, because whenever you're answering, that's like a signal that when you're approaching this child, you have to be very careful to make sure you know that they're really rejecting you before you push them, you sort of reject them or shut them down. Um, so again, he's not rejecting the idea of rejecting your child. At the beginning, he totally embraced that. But he's saying he is treading with caution, right? Like, don't do that unless you know that this is really the circumstance that calls for it. Um, okay, I'm going to go one step further. This is the Maharil. Um, Maharil was the brother of the Tzemach, Rabbi Huda Leib Schneerson, I believe, the brother of the Tzemach Tzedek, who's the third Rabbi of Lubavitch. He founded some Chosidus called Kapust, and that's what I know about him. Um, but he says this, right? He's going to turn it even, even one step further. He's, this is sort of like the first step towards interpreting, not even, not sort of saying you're rejecting the son, but it's okay, it makes sense, whatever, whatever, or it's only in limited circumstances, but saying like, actually, what well, you're not really rejecting your son. This turn of phrase, hakei achinav, means hakei hainu chalishutakava, you should blunt his teeth. His teeth is a metaphor for his desires, right? The things that cause him to sin. Um, and then he goes into this whole thing in, um, this is actually in his commentary on Bava Mitzia, I believe, um, in the Arba Avot Nazikin, sorry, Bava Kama, um, right, the, the types of damage, one is called Shane Varegel, right, the types of damage animals can do with their teeth and with their legs, which basically means things that animals do because they're doing their animal thing, they're walking around and they're eating stuff, and that's what animals do, they eat stuff, right, so like, that sort of, people also can be like that. You can go around your ordinary business and sort of like follow your desires, 
quote unquote, and Hakea Chinav is advice to the parents to kind of try and steer him away from that so that you could bring him back to the Torah. Um, so this is, I think, that sort of the, the first source we've seen that seems to really undercut the idea of rejecting the wicked child at all. Um, it's saying like, you know, undo his wickedness, right? Engage with him. Now, exactly how the response to him engages with him remains to be seen shortly, I hope. Um, I'll get there in a second. Okay. So I wanted to share one other thought. Um, this I heard from Dina Weiss. You can read about it. Um, maybe I, here, one second. I'm going to put this in the chat briefly. Um, a friend of mine, she teaches at Hadar and she has a, um, I will, I'll link it to you if you want. I hope that's okay. Um, like um, if you want to, if you want to see more of her, flesh it out. Um, but she also connects it to the, um, oh, I'm sorry. I see so many questions um, <laughs> that I missed. Right. So I think that like, she also links it to this Pasuk from place from Yirmiyahu or Yeshayahu. It appears in a few places of Achlu Boser. And she says, right. When we say Hakei et Shinav, let's think about the wicked son's question. His question is, what does this matter to me? fine, maybe you left Egypt or your grandparents left Egypt. Maybe you care about this, but what does it matter to me? I don't care about it, right? And your answer to him is, hakei et shinav. Actually, you know, in the Tanakh, this is a complaint. Our parents ate sour grapes. Why should we suffer? But actually, that is how it works. Sometimes, right, what we experience as a child is determined or partially determined or shaped by what our parents have experienced, right? Hakea Chinav means tell him like, you can't disassociate yourself from this community so easily, right? You're a part of this community. And for example, when we say, Ilu hayasham, lo hayanigal, if you had been there, you wouldn't have been redeemed. It's a way of saying, right, you want in on the good parts of being part of this nation, right? You want in on the redemption and you want in on maybe like the fun holidays or whatever, right? So you can't then disassociate yourself from the parts that you find less positive or less fun. It comes as a package, right? Hakea Chinav means sort of teach him that in fact, the things that parents do do matter to their children. Sometimes children see that as a positive. Sometimes they see it as a negative, but it's always there. Um, so I actually really like that answer. Um, that's what I've been talking about with a bunch of teenagers. And it's been super interesting because they all, many of them really love the Russia. Um, you know, a lot of people sometimes will even, ident you know, they'll, they'll lay the, the four sons out in age order. Um, you know, like the Shano the Yudeli show is a child, the Tom is like elementary school age, then the Russia is like the teenager, and then the Chacham is like the mature person. So one of my students actually was like, well, I think he thought the Russia is the oldest, because that's like, obviously the most mature is the person who questions everything, which was great and very teenage-like thing to say. Um, but like, um, you know, I think there's something, there's something there about kind of acknowledging his concern and trying to help him see well, um, yes, but there's more being sort of part, being not totally your own independent person who's just like setting out in the world with no baggage can feel like baggage, but can also have something positive coming from it. Um, I think that one, to me, as I've been thinking about that, one thing that I think it sort of brings out is maybe before when we talked about what are you actually saying to the Russia, right? In the, in the earlier text, you're saying to him, if you had been there, you wouldn't have been redeemed. But in our text, you're not saying that to him. You just say, you say, God did this for me. Um, and you might be thinking, and if you were there with that attitude, you wouldn't have been redeemed, right? But you don't necessarily say that to the child because part of it is sort of letting them figure, figure out what they want into, right? You just, like, I just think it's, sort of very interesting educationally or psychologically or familiarly to, to present it that way of sort of the child is like I don't want to do any of this this is so dumb why do I care what you care about and you're like here's why it's important to me right and maybe as you mature it will be important to you too you think that but you don't say that to them in so many words because 
you're sort of in some ways respecting their need for space. Um, like you're sort of modeling for them what you think is meaningful and you're hoping that they're going to come around and become like the chacham um, as they grow up and sort of want to understand more of the details of what they're, they are receiving from you or can receive from you. So um, that's sort of what I, what I want to say about the Rasha to some degree, which I think is in some ways, it's not just because for us, you know, modern psychological people, it feels wrong, but also like the text itself is the most problematic about the Rasha. It's a mashup of two different biblical verses. It has this other allusion to Akei okay, Chinav, like what's going on there? Um, I think, you know, it's a big range of what's going on there. In some ways, it's the most fruitful for figuring out like, what are we really doing here? Um, and I wanted to end with one thought that connects the Rasha to the Chacham or um, something like that. So as an introduction, I would say, right, frequently the Rasha and Chacham are introduced as opposites to each other, right? Um, right, like in the book, the Rosh Chacham get kind of like the most bandwidth. Um, they're the ones we care about the most and we talk about them a lot. And the Talmud that like, you know, in the art, they're just kind of like the little kids on the side. Um, you know, really, if you want to think about it otherwise, the Tam is, pro is probably the opposite of either the Chacham or like in terms of opposites, right? Like who's the opposite of the Chacham, the wise son? The wise son is an intellectual characteristic. So it could be that the simple son, if he's a simple ton, is the opposite of him. It could be if he's simple, like naive, that he's the opposite of the Rasha. Um, one of my students this year said she thought the Sheno Yudeli Shol is the opposite of the Rasha because the Rasha asks a very pointed question and the Sheno Yudeli Shol doesn't know how to ask any questions. I thought that was a very interesting observation. Um, but in any case, right, there's sort of like this, this tension between the Rasha and the Chacham, almost like this is two directions where an intellectually capable child could go. Um, but so it, it seems here, that yeah. the, the text in the Agadah is in a chiastic structure. So that means that the uh, outside, uh, the, the first and the last uh, child are opposites of each other, and the two middle childs are opposites of each other. But the, the Rasha and the Tam are opposite each other. Yeah, I think that's no, certainly no, the, one of the... Yeah, so the Nita uh, Chacham and the Sheno Yudea Lishol are opposites, and then the middle two are also opposites. Yeah, I think that's probably the most straightforward way of seeing it. Um, but I thought it was interesting to say, like some people do try and say that, see the Rasha as the opposite of the Sheno Yudea Lishol, especially if you see the Tam as intellectually simple. Um, I just, th I think it's sort of, it's an interesting thing to play with, like, because what's getting the, the Rasha to be labeled as the Rasha here is his question in the very precise way that he asks it. Um, but, but yeah, though, I think, I think as a straightforward thing, right, it's like the Chacham versus the Shino I agree with that. Um, fine. So I wanted to sort of end with a thought about sort of the, uh, well, here's, here's the entryway. Lush Mordechai was the founding Rosh Hashiva of Hebron. Yeshiva Hebron, which was originally in Hebron, and then Yerushalayim and spun off. Okay. Um, so this is, we're talking about a 20th century person. Um, and he says, Harasha asks, Madua loli histapek beli maase. He says, why, right, if the purpose, the Rasha is already like two steps ahead of you. He's saying, why do we do this thing? And you're going to be like, oh, because God took us out of Egypt. And he's like, I know God took us out of Egypt, but why do we do this thing? Right? I don't care, right? I can just read a story. I know God took us out of Egypt. Why am I doing this whole killing of an animal and sitting around and whatever? Like he's saying, why do we need to do the action if we can just sort of be, suffice ourselves with the reason? Meaning we can remember Yitzhak Mitzrayim without eating matzah or without doing the other rituals. Um, okay, so if that's his question, First of all, it, it underlines how he's sort of seen as kind of sophisticated. But the reason I brought this is because I think it contrasts him to the, um, the Chacham in an interesting way. On the next page, you have a, a long passage. I think you have it. Did I put it here? From the Imre MS, who is the second Rebbe of Gur, the son of the Sas MS. But I just wanted to say outside a thought from the Sas MS about this question that I think... Um, really connects it to this idea of the Rasha. He says, the, the, the Chacham asks, Ma ha'edot right? What are the rules, the statutes, and the laws, right? Um, he has a good vocabulary, and each of those things is traditionally understood to be slightly different, right? A dot are kind of like one kind of rule. Chukim, mishpatim are sort of rules that make sense, um, like maybe sort of, you know, 
social societal rules and chukim are understood to be rules that don't make sense right that, or that we don't understand the reason for like those chukat torah the paraduma it's a chok right we sort of talk about chok is like there's always some things that you don't understand so the Svasana says well if chukim are things that we don't understand the reason what is the wise son really asking how can he ask what's the meaning of these chukim if chukim are not supposed to have meanings that we can access, right? And he says, actually, it's not like I said before, like the afikomen is just sort of the last of a long list of halachot. We pick specifically on a halacha that has to do with eating matzah. This is a little anachronistic, but okay, right? We pick specifically on halacha that has to do with eating matzah. Again, right, in the mish. In the Mishnah, it doesn't have to do with eating matzah, but okay, right. Alakha that has to do with eating matzah because matzah is something where also, right, he's making a pun between ta'am meaning reason and ta'am meaning taste. Matzah is something that has a very, shall we say, subtle taste. It's not a most flavorful food, right? But he says, right, when you eat the matzah alone and you don't eat something afterwards and you don't adulterate it, that's when you can kind of appreciate the ta'am of the matzah. Okay. Um, and Tom, what you're... Ha-matzot, Tom Hamatzot versus Tom Hamitzvot. Yes. Oh, that's also cute. Tom Hamatzot and Tom Hamitzvot. Right. So you can understand the taste of the matzah is a pun also with the reason for the mitzvah. Right. You can understand the taste of the matzah if you accept it and don't pile more stuff onto it. If you eat it. Right. The same thing is the, the Svaz Emma says is actually true for mitzvot, right? Chukim are things that we can't understand by investigating them, but maybe we can understand them by accepting them, doing them, and then investigating or meditating on them. That, right, the, the Ben Chacham, what characterizes him is his willingness to buy in and then investigate, and that that opens up possibilities for understanding that are not available before you buy in. Right, similar idea to not seven nishma. Right, there are some things, possibilities for understanding that are not available until you buy in and sort of accept the system. Then you can access certain ideas. So that's sort of where I wanted to to sort of wrap up. Right, if the Russia is the person who is not willing to buy in, just like I already know the reason and I don't need to do the mitzvah, he's going to miss something. Right, that if you actually do the activity there's more available to you in terms of understanding it. And I think that that's sort of something interesting for us to think of, you know, to come back to how many sons are there, right? So in the Torah, there's like, you know, however many children there are running around B'nai Israel is how many children there are. It's not about specific types of children. The Haggadah has four types of children, but really, you know, people like to say this, but I don't think it's just a modern view, right? There are, each of us has all of these types in us at different times. We have different types in the family. You have different types in different generations. Um, and one of the key experiences of the Seder is that it is bodily, experiential. It's not just telling a story, right? And you might sort of, we present that as like, oh, that's for the little kids, the matzah, the this, but it's not. It's for all of us, that there's something about um, accepting and doing and sort of literally internalizing these symbolic actions that opens up possibilities of understanding for us, maybe. Um, so... I hope that that becomes true for all of us this year. I'll end with one. I'll, this is, I know I said I'll end. I'll end with really, really end now. Um, uh, this idea of sort of like when you do, when you eat the matzah alone is when you really kind of can fulfill its flavor. You know, it's a little bit of a leap of faith. I think a lot of us are going to be taking that leap of faith unwillingly this year because our Pesach experience is going to be much more minimalistic than in the past. Um, and so I think that that's, you know, fewer people, less stuff, less food, whatever it is. Um, and I think that, you know, that's sort of an interesting challenge for us is like, when you have just something that seems like it doesn't have a taste, right? Just the matzah, what's going to be, but you sort of jump into that and embrace it. What, what are you going to find there? Um, so I hope that we all find something worthwhile even in these difficult circumstances. And I thank you all. Well, for why is that a challenge? Uh, why is that a are? challenge a bit more minimalistic? What about people who want it more minimalistic, who hey, don't want to have their kishkas ripped out with all these unnecessary expenses? For some people, it's a blessing. 
It's not a challenge. It's what some of us want, being burdened with all this unnecessary work and unnecessary obligations. Some of us want it minimal, and we're being dragged and pressured into doing things that have nothing to do with halaha every year. What is this challenge and minimal? I feel I have a lot of compassion for people who are ill, people who are se separated from their families. I know a lot of people are having challenges now, but the, the, the basic concept of minimalism is, is something to aspire to. It forces you to concentrate on what is really important and not a lot of studio and not a lot of expenses. So no, I, I don't think it's a challenge. I think it's a gift. Okay, I mean, I think that like, you know, I personally, I think it's very easy to say that about the stuff of Pesach, right? Like the food or whatever it is. I think it's, it is much harder to say that about like being with your grandparents or grandchildren or parents. Um, to, you know, personally, that's where I sort of see the main challenges coming for a lot of people now. Um, maybe some people don't like to be with their families. That's also true. And maybe this is a good, this year in some ways is a good excuse for them. Um, I, I don't know. Yeah, I can't speak for everyone's experience. Um, but I do think that like, you know, in some ways, when your hand is forced in a certain direction, there, you never know what's going to come out of that. And we'll, I guess we'll see for all of us. Done. Thanks. Miriam Heights, Nissan, thanks so much. Oh, hi. Thanks so much. Uh, hi. I have a contribution to make about uh, subject of challenges and Hake Ashinov. I uh, I did study that stuff. Another friend showed me that uh, pasuk uh, that that verse last year that the uh, Hatam Sofer quotes from uh, Yermia uh, that you explained so well. Uh, as a dentist, um, let's see how would I explain this? Um, the force of the jaws of both jaws are supposed to be balanced over an even set of teeth. Now there are some teeth that are bigger than others. Some are longer. Some are wider but they all are supposed to be evenly biting with the opposing set of dentition, your upper teeth and your lower teeth. When you have a tooth that's out of place, in this case, the Russia who feels out of place, that um, the, the nerve underneath your tooth, around your tooth, is the most sensitive nerve in your body. Yes, it's not, it's not elsewhere. It's actually the periodontal ligament, and that transmits uh, a, a, the... Uh, proprioception of, um, uh, you know, of the whole of that jaw hitting that one tooth. The acids in the Pasuk and Yermia would wear out the teeth. I don't see it the way the Hatam uh, Sofer did. It would even the teeth. And that's what Hake, as that other Acheron said, Hake means to blunt, to soften his bite. He feels out of place. He did show up, but he feels apart. Not, not. Uh, he he feels a part in one, you know, without having that as as two um, uh, as a two syllable word. We want him to feel part of the collective, and that's what the softening does. Now, when you come to my office or any good dentist, you know, he 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 uses a drill to um, to get rid of that. Um, we of, of that um, point of that that's that's occluding first. Right, mm -hmm. but uh, in in the ancient time, acid would have done that. The acid of the sour grapes, and that that I believe is is the meaning so of meaning, what the Baal right. Haggadah is saying. That's interesting. That it is, by, it's a tikkun. It's right. I, I think I think it's not just an, a sort of a way to say right. Even though some people embrace the harshness of it, I, I I I like that a lot. And thank you. I think that like right. That's that's another way of sort of reading it as like, you know you're responding to him and actually trying to engage him and help him as opposed to push him away. So I appreciate that. Um, thanks all.